thank you everyone for being here. I know it's the last session of the day, last session of the whole conference. So thank you for being here and for staying awake and sticking around this long. Um, this talk is going to be about doing developer relations for emerging technologies, specifically looking at my experience and my team's experience of doing developer relations. Although a lot of the stuff that we're going to cover can general, be generalized to anyone doing DevRel in an emerging technology space. And even if you're not currently doing that, but you may be considering in the future, hopefully this will give you something um, useful. A little bit about me. I'm moving on. Mm -hmm. It's like the slides are not moving. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay, so a little bit of a lag with the <laughs> slides. <laughs> um, yeah, just apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, yeah, hopefully the speed up a little bit as we get going. Um, yeah, so a little bit about me. Um, Abby, um, I am an ex web developer, that was my first job in tech. At IBM, uh, before moving into my current role um, as a developer advocate, also at IBM, uh, the department that I currently work in is the quantum computing department, um, and specifically what I work on is an open source SDK for quantum computing called Qiskit. Um, another fun fact about me: I was born in South Africa. I grew up in the UK, um, and I now live in New York. Okay, so. What do we mean when we say emerging technologies? This is quite a nebulous term, it's open to interpretation, um, but essentially what it means is any technology that has yet to really reach its full potential, um, it might have a kind of a broad spectrum of kind of adoption, maybe it's like really early stages, still very much in academia, maybe it's something like artificial intelligence where it's really already kind of somewhat emerged but we're still trying to see where it's going to go. Um, and I like to think about it as like any buzzword in technology is probably some form of emerging technology. Um, it's just a few examples of quite well known ones. Obviously artificial intelligence is on everyone's mind at the moment, chat you see. Um, fun fact, I actually created the title for this talk using ChatGPT, so if you don't like the title, don't blame me. Um, so yeah, there, and I think ChatGPT is actually a really great example of a technology where DevRel has been really effective at kind of promoting the technology itself. Um, but I don't work in AI, I work in quantum computing, so let's take a moment to give you the TLDR for quantum computing. Um, I promise you that you do not need to have a great depth of knowledge in quantum to be able to understand what I'm going to tell you today. Um, but these are just kind of the basic information. This is probably just nice, kind of good to know to kind of help you through this talk and when other you know, blogs or articles come up that you might see about this technology. Um, so essentially, quantum computing is a type of computation based on the principles of quantum mechanics. Um, it's actually a lot older than people think. Like research into quantum mechanics has been around since the early 1900s. Pretty soon after that, research came into building computers that can be based on quantum mechanics, and we've had real devices, um, real quantum computers, essentially since 1998. Um, and the way that quantum computers work, instead of using bits like a regular classical computer, uh, computers use qubits or quantum bits. Um, and one day we hope to be able to use quantum computers to solve problems that are too complex for classical computers to um, achieve. Um, and today you can already write code, run experiments, do research on real quantum devices, such as those produced by IBM Quantum, um, and you can interact with them using open source SDKs for quantum computing like Qiskit. So, those are the basics, that's all you need to know. Forget about it now, let's talk about DevRel. Um, 
Emerging technology, like any technology, can really benefit from developer relations um, work and good DevRel strategy. This is just kind of like a broad summary of the type of DevRel impact that we had both with Qiskit and with IBM Quantum. Um, obviously, with any DevRel <laughs> metrics, take them with a huge bucket of salt. Um, but hopefully, this kind of just gives you a bit of an ideal for the scope of what we do, the kind of reach that we had. Um, and yeah, I would argue that actually DevRel is not only really beneficial in emerging technology, but pretty essential because um, there's very little else out there for people to engage with on topics like emerging technologies. Um, and so that is where DevRel um, practitioners really thrive. We create content, we bridge that information gap. Our job is to go and Educate people, um, whether that's for you know any tech product or for an emerging technology. Um, and also with these emerging technologies, there's not a lot of trust built up yet. We've had a lot from different talks today about the importance of building trust with your user. And as general practitioners, we should be pretty good at doing that. So we can just apply those things in DevRel. Um, so how do you do good DevRel for emerging technology? I'm going to share a few of the things that we do um, in our in our team, um, and hopefully you'll be able to apply that in any of the emerging technology fields that you work in, or possibly even in your existing work, even if it's not in an emerging field. So that's going to say you just start off with what you know. There are a lot of classic DevRel skills that are pretty much the same things that you, whether you apply them in an emerging tech field or just an already emerged tech. Um, so starting off with being user-centric. You, it's never a bad idea to keep your users in mind, get feedback as developer advocates. Your job is to be the voice of the user to the entire teams and vice versa. Um, and you know, understanding the culture of the developers and the users is really important. I would argue that's probably an important skill to have, even if you're in any job in tech, whether it's DevRel, whether it's being a dev yourself, always just being user-centric is just good advice for life, really, at this point. Next up is create good content. Content is a huge part of what we do um, as DevRel practitioners, and the same kind of things that you think about when creating good content in your regular DevRel job will be very effective in emerging technologies as well. Um, every developer wants good documentation, tutorials, live stream, all of that. They want new ways to learn new things. Um, and always make sure the code is at the center of what you do. This is also especially important, I think, in emerging technologies because sometimes when you're dealing with really complex topics like quantum computing, it's actually easier to engage with developers if you speak to them with code. Sometimes it's easier for me to say, Instead of me trying to explain this whole quantum mechanics stuff to you, why don't we just like look at how the code actually works? And then that it really helps to kind of bridge that that gap in knowledge. So always having code at the center of the quantum you create is just always good practice for that realm. And make sure you're using accessible language, understand the types of users that you have, what kind of phrasing and terminology resonates with them, what kind of jargon they will understand or not understand. Um, and don't patronize your audience either. Um, just good advice generally have empathy when you're engaging with your audience. No one likes to feel dumb when they're learning something new. So just always make sure that you're being empathetic, especially in emerging technologies where the subject matter is really hard. And lowering that barrier to entry is super important. Um, and the third thing here is understanding your community. In pretty much every tech community, you kind of have this population, which is a mixture of user types, and you need to be making sure that the work that you're doing is going to address all the different types of users that might be in your community. So you have the people kind of on the outskirts of the kind of spectrum that are probably just getting started and maybe hobbyists. They're, kind of, they're not super committed to your product yet. Um, but they're still important to you know transition to that next stage. Then you have your active users, the people that turn into customers that um, are really actively engaging with your product. 
And then finally you have to promote it to the people then that go out and say yes to other people, use this product, use this tool. And obviously there's nuances depending on the product and the type of technology, but I think most of them generally fit this model and understanding that and making sure that you're not skewing your efforts too much towards one or the other um, can be really useful for kind of nurturing and growing your community in a focused way. Okay, now let's talk about some of the key differences for doing DevRel for an emerging technology. The first one I want to talk about is the closeness to academia. So first up, what you have here is a lot of emerging technology started very much in an academic field. It was research, it was papers, it was universities, and then as you know, it emerges, it kind of goes out into industry, and then you're, it kind of reaches a much broader audience, it starts making people money. Um, and this is where, when you're in that emerging stage, you're somewhere in between that academia and industry kind of space, and as a Deborah practitioner, your role is really to kind of try and push that needle towards industry, towards profitability. But this can also bring a lot of unique challenges. For example, because you're so close to academia now, you have some very challenging subject matter to get yourself through. It's not just kind of Googling answers to the scope of flow, it's reading research papers and trying to understand academic jargon and then translate that into something that people in industry can understand. There's also possibly very few experts out there that actually know how to do this stuff, and so finding good, reliable sources can be really hard. Also, a very different culture. Um, research culture is very different from. Okay, hopefully it will Research culture is very different to dev culture. It's you know again, like I said, like very academic, uh, paper focused. Um, you know, you're not going to dev conferences, you're going to research conferences, and understanding the differences between a typical researcher and a typical developer is really important here. Um, and this also comes with a healthy dose of imposter syndrome, because I know everyone gets imposter syndrome working in tech or just going through life, but it's kind of amplified another level when you show up to meetings and literally everyone around you has a PhD. I think I have a monthly existential crisis where I think maybe I need a PhD or I don't know what, something. Um, but, you know, that's kind of something you have to deal with, and I'll give you some tips in a minute for doing that. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to highlight in terms of challenges here is very unclear user groups. You don't know yet, I guess, which, whether you have a researcher is your top target audience, or maybe like a product developer. You might have to sometimes appeal to both, and that can be a real challenge, because those two groups of people, like I said, have very different cultures, very different language that resonates them, they have very different needs. So how can you kind of deal with these challenges better? The first thing I would say is make sure you understand where your tech is on that needle between academia and industry. Is it something that's still very much close to the academic side or is it maybe something more like artificial intelligence where it's kind of almost, I would say, all the way over towards main, mainly industry applications now? Because um, this will help you target your users better with the content you're creating, with your priorities, all of that kind of thing. I would also say rec recognize that developer and researcher is a spectrum. You do get some people that are like devs through and through. They don't have anything to do with research. And you get researchers that are very theory focused and have never written a line of code in their life. But you will have a lot of people that kind of like swim between the two. They maybe identify more as a researcher, but they still are writing code. Um, maybe they are a dev who's also kind of publishing papers. Um, so understanding that people generally are a little bit of a mix of both can be really helpful here. Um, next up for that imposter syndrome one, recognize your own value add. If you're coming into this space, you're coming into it for a reason, and that is because there is a gap for your skills. Um, it's really hard to communicate complex topics to people. And as DevRel practitioners, that is something that we're kind of good at, probably better than the average researcher or developer actually building the tech. So that is the, the key thing that you are adding to the conversation. Um, and then the next one is make sure you're getting stuck in. Make sure you're learning the hard stuff. 
because that's just going to make you a better developer relations expert. In fact, whatever you're doing, make sure that you're actively trying to know more about the technology that you're trying to move forward. Make sure that you are working as close as you can to the developers producing your product, build relationships with them. Um, and yeah, make sure that you're asking questions. Don't feel shy about that because that's going to be the quickest way for you to be able to learn. Next up, I would say hire intentionally. If you're trying to build a DevRel team to work on an emerging tech, pull from different backgrounds. Pull people from a DevRel background, but also pull people from a more kind of research or technical background as well. Build an interdisciplinary team where you can help each other and you can kind of supplement each other's skills. Um, and lastly, support students. Emerging technology is, you know, it's not going to give you um, return on investment right away. You need to be investing in the future generation of practitioners for this technology. And that means building student groups, going to universities, making sure you are investing in the kind of academic institutions that are going to be pumping out the future industry professionals that you are going to be selling your product to. Okay, the next key difference that I want to talk about when it comes to doing TevRel in emerging technology is dealing with the hype. This is the Gartner hype diagram. It's one of my favorite diagrams. Um, it kind of shows how as the visibility of your technology increases over time, this can kind of lead to this kind of weird squiggle in terms of people's kind of adoption or kind of the reputation of your technology. And too much hype can kind of lead to this kind of peak of inflated expectations, which normally comes by a very hard crash down to reality. And then finally, people kind of, you know, start to find something useful out of it as time goes on. Um, and there is so much hype in quantum computing, especially um, if I have to read one more blog about how quantum computing is going to solve climate change, I think I'm going to scream. Um, <laughs> But like, I understand why people do it, right? People get super excited. It is a very exciting technology. They think that this emerging tech is going to change the world and make everyone a billion dollars or something. Um, the issue comes when people try to capitalize on that hype for clicks, for attention. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the worst case scenario. There's also the, on the other side of that is that, you know, this technology is not very well understood and it's very difficult subject matter. So sometimes people just don't know any better. So that kind of leads to misleading, a lot of misleading information out there. So my job as a developer advocate within quantum computing is I'm trying my best to make the graph go like this rather than getting that you know, ugly red squiggle. Um, and how do, I, how do we do this? Um, at Qiskit and IBM Quantum. The main thing that we do is we really try not to overpromise anything, um, almost sometimes to our detriment. Um, you know, sometimes we, you know, you want to be able to use the hype to your benefit, but you should always be transparent about the limitations of what your technology can actually do. Um, and you can almost kind of spin that in an exciting way. So you can kind of say, oh, well, you know, there's still so much further to go. Like, we don't know where it's going. Um, maybe, you know, you could be the next person to, like, make a breakthrough here. Maybe this is why we need more, you know, investment in education. And we need more people getting involved in open source. So you can kind of turn that into those limitations into a strength and, like, a reason why people might want to get involved more in the technology. Um, and I think it's also beneficial to kind of position yourself within any emerging technology space as, you know, an actor that can really cut through the noise when everyone else is kind of falling into that hype kind of machine. If you can be the one to say like, well, well, well hold on a minute, let's like take it back to reality. It gives you a lot more credibility as well. And the last difference that I want to talk about is uncertainty. So we've all been through a lot for the last few years, we've all been dealing with a lot of uncertainty, COVID and incoming recession. Um, and when you're working in emerging technology, that you kind of have an extra cloud of uncertainty that's kind of hovering over you at the same time, because you don't really know where this technology is going to go. You don't know if it's going to succeed or not. 
um, you know, and this can, you know, make it hard sometimes to get buy-in from people as well. Um, but, you know, we're all still here. The fact that we are having this conference right now and we all still have our jobs mean that we have managed to do DevRel very successfully through COVID and despite an oncoming recession, that means that we already have like pretty good skill being able, being able to deal with uncertainty already. Um, and so doing that in emerging technology is the same, just more. So it's just the same skills that you need to fall back on. Um, so my kind of top tips for this, which probably all of you could take back to, you know, even your own jobs, not in emerging tech. Um, first one is metrics. Um, always be ready to demonstrate your value. Be ready that, you know, the next, when the next quarterly budget, you know, is getting set, you know, be able to like go to those executive meetings and be able to demonstrate the value your team is bringing at the drop of a hat. So make sure that you are collecting any data that you have um, before you need them. Always have them ready in your back pocket to kind of pull out at a moment's notice. Um, Particularly in like when times are changing, like, you know, from one day to the next, you can have, you know, changes in the market or, you know, world events that could like drastically change the status of your product and where it's going. This is really important. Um, also, make sure you're being creative with where you're finding your data. Think about things that you, you know, aren't just the normal things, but stuff that maybe you could kind of spin in a useful way. Um, I also always like to push that a mixture of qualitative and quantitative data is important. Um, some, especially when you're going to those meetings with execs and trying to like kind of fight for your team and fight for the work that you're doing. You know, you are essentially trying to bargain with humans. And if you're just presented with a lot of data, humans can kind of become desensitized to it. Having a few nice anecdotes to put into your slide about the impact your team is having can actually have a really profound impact on the people that you're trying to convince of your value. Especially if you can sprinkle in an anecdote from a high profile client or someone with a pretty well-respected reputation. If someone has you know, said something in an event about how important your team was in upskilling their, um, you know, their team a specific product, that is super, helpful to add in amongst all of the more kind of quantitative metrics. And it also helps bulk things up a bit if you don't have many of those quantitative metrics. Next thing is budget. Obviously, it would be lovely to come to Japan and to in-person talks all the time. But the reality is that, you know, budgets are really tight at the moment. So we need to be using all of those virtual skills that we built up during COVID to be able to kind of switch things at a moment's notice, be able to like keep using those virtual skills to be able to pull off good DevRel activities. Um, and also make sure you are prioritizing what events or initiatives are kind of highest impact for essentially lowest cost. Um, and make sure you're automating as much of your job as possible. So that leaves you more time to focus on doing the, the more kind of person intens intensive stuff. Um, and also leverage your community. Um, if you, you know, have extra members in your community willing to kind of volunteer to help you run an initiative, that is a really great source of I mean, free labor sounds a little bit harsh, but like, you know, <laughs> um, very passionate people willing to kind of support you during hard times. And the last one that point that I want to make on this is just embrace the uncertainty, especially in emerging technologies. Uncertainty is kind of a certainty. Um, and so you need to kind of just roll with it. And you know, this is your life now, you've got to be adaptable and resilient and be able to deal with all these kind of unchanging, changing situations. Um, and I would also say, make sure you can change the narrative. When we're in these very kind of uncertain times, this can be very scary to clients and investors and users. So you need to be able to reassure them as well that what you're doing is important um, and will give them a return on investment. So being able to switch the narrative and say, hey, I know this is a very uncertain situation, but actually this is a really exciting time to be in this space. We don't know what's going to happen. Like, this means that like, you could have a potentially really high impact if you are one of you know, the first people getting involved in this space. 
So just kind of like changing the perspective a bit can really kind of help deal with these kind of very uncertain um, moments. Um, and yeah, that's kind of all I have to say on this really. Um, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, fire away. All right. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, any questions from the audiences? Hey, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm curious, uh, where, where does your DevRel team, who does your DevRel team report to and what kind of metrics do you look at? Yes. So it really depends. We have... My team specifically are one of the only teams we kind of self-identify as, as DevRel, but I would argue that a lot of the other teams within our IBM Quantum kind of group are doing DevRel activities in different ways. Like we have like an events focused team, we have like a traditional marketing focused teams, and a lot of them are also doing DevRel activities. Um, so I can't really speak for them, but I can speak for my specific team. Um, we focus a lot on open source metrics, because um, we focus a lot on Kiskit, the open source SDK. Um, so we look at things like number of package downloads, um, also the number of dependents. We really want to focus on, um, you know, because we're working in emerging tech, we're not just building our own product, we're also trying to build up a whole industry. So we really care about building up an ecosystem of open source projects that are creating good software for people to be able to use quantum computers. So any, we focus a lot on how many different packages out there are depending on our package as a way to kind of measure the health of our open source ecosystem. And I guess kind of the health of the quantum computing ecosystem generally. Good, right, thank you. All right, thanks. Next question. Thank you. That was phenomenal. And I really related to a lot of that. Um, one question that I had is, you know, there's, like you mentioned, a lot of hype around some of this stuff. How can you rein in the community and help, you know, settle things down? Do you um, create content that is not combative of that, but, you know, um, what strategies do you use to do that? Yeah, so I I don't think we would ever say that we're like combative. If we are ever combative, then we'll do it in research. Like if another company puts out some kind of flashy paper that actually doesn't really say very much, then we don't respond directly, but we'll put out a paper with like our own data, which kind of maybe like disputes that. Um, we When we're creating our own content, we have, you know, we try to, hire very good intelligent people and make sure that we're all kind of educating each other as much as possible um, we have kind of some content guidelines as well about things that we kind of can and can't say like i said earlier having that interdisciplinary team so having researchers that actually like know their shit when it comes to quantum computing having someone like that on your team who can kind of fact check what you're doing really helps to make sure that like we're not putting out content that is disingenuous or false um, and we do also, when we invite kind of members of our community to like do guest blog posts or things like that, we will always, you know, do our due diligence in proofreading that. We'll try very hard to kind of mentor members of our community, upskill them and trying to kind of lead by example to a certain extent. Um, and yeah, that's kind of generally what we do. <laughs> Again, thanks to Abby for the great talk, and people have a great round of applause. Thank you so much.